Hey everybody, um, so I know everyone's waiting for me to comment on the new Marilyn Manson allegations and a lot of other topics like that, but um, something really occurred to me today that uh, I want to talk about. You know, one of the, one of the per uh, hot topics of particular note in internet discussion lately has been Andrew Tate. And, uh, you know, he is definitely one of the largest and most painful discharges from the psychological anus that is the internet and internet culture. Uh, and I was thinking about something, you know, something I've talked about a lot is that a few years ago, uh, it's getting where I'm... Uh, I wouldn't just say a few years ago, it's getting further and further in the past, thank God. But years ago, I was exposed to the so-called manosphere in a very real way. I never committed to being a part of it, but a number of people pressured me into um, associating with it and would not take no for an answer. And I got to see a real up got I got a real up close and personal look at what is alternately a ridiculous and terrifying uh, subculture of people. And I've done a lot of videos warning people to stay away from it, and especially obviously young men to stay away from it. And um, Andrew Tate is kind of the ultimate kingpin of the um, the multivariant cult entity that is the manosphere. And there's this huge discussion raging about what is and is not so-called quote-unquote true masculinity. And what does it mean to be a real man and true masculinity and all of this? And in in the internet discourse, that concept, the, the meaning of that concept has been shaped entirely by people like Andrew Tate, who have this ridiculous cartoon concept of what it means to be a real man and re, really masculine and all that. And basically, it's that if, you know, it's that if you are not living the life of a Far Cry villain, then you don't constitute a real man or real, uh, a, a real masculine man and all of this stuff. And that was on my mind today because I don't, you know, I, I try to talk about obviously my personal life in the most vague possible terms, but today I had to take a very elderly person to the emergency room. And that's all of the information I want to give about what actually happened. All of a sudden, I found myself in a situation where I was caring for someone who was not in a, you know, I, I was caring for someone who suddenly needed me to be in charge of the situation and suddenly was relying on me and I had to make quick decisions and I had to uh, be a, a face of strength and command and a commanding presence in this situation getting this person where they needed to be talking to doctors talking to nurses all of this stuff And, um, you know, when you go to the emergency room, you wait, uh, you end up waiting a long time, uh, usually, uh, fortunately, fortunately we got, um, we, we were able to get seen very quickly, but, um, you know, they have to do all the tests and wait for the results and things like that. And so we were there for many hours. And 
I, um, you know, it was a very, as you can imagine, a very trying situation. Being in the emergency room is a great, the emergency room is a great place to count your blessings. Because, like, I, I saw one man being wheeled by that was hooked up to every machine you can imagine. Um, at one point, once everything was under control in our situation, and we knew we were, you know, we got, you know, we finally got that, we finally got the nurse that, or the nurse that gives us the message of, hey, everything's looking okay, uh, everything, we think everything's gonna be fine, we're just waiting for a couple more tests to come back before we discharge you. And you can kind of start to breathe easy a little bit. I was walking, at that point, I decided to go to the, um, emergent there go to the hospital cafeteria and get a meal for myself and while I was walking there um I looked in I I, I you know you you should not obviously you should not you should give these people their privacy and not look into the different exam rooms and everything but I walked by this one room and there was this old man uh laying on the table and uh or not the table laying on the uh the the uh the gurney and it was all dark in the room except for one light overhead that was coming down single light that was coming down over him and he looked like he was just motionless and staring up at it uh and a little while later they wheeled a body um uh, they, they wheeled a dead body past uh, past us, and this was a, the a person that they had pulled the sheet up over the person's face, and they were completely covering the body and everything. And I realized that was probably that that old man, and he had probably died, and he had probably died alone. There was nobody there uh, with with him. They were you know they were handling this. There were nobody around, so he had probably died alone. And. Um, as I was eating, and I finally had to, and I, I have to say, there's always people talk about hospital food not being very good. The food was fucking fantastic. Like, we were talking, I had, God, they had shrimp, and I had shrimp, chicken, and rice all prepared beautifully. I, they had uh, green beans, too, but the green beans were, like, candied or something. There was some weird thing that they, they were very, like, uncomfortably sweet. I didn't like those, but... The food was fucking phenomenal. Like, of course, also, I, you know, also I'm going on, this is like after me going on hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of not having food. Uh, so that probably affected it too. But anyway, I thought about it as I was finally getting to a place where I could start to calm down inside. I was thinking about, I was proud of myself and pleased with the way that I had handled everything because... I could have, I, you know, when the emergency situation presented itself, I was a lot of things. I was terrified. I was um, scared, confused, uncertain, all of these things. And, you know, I think that when uh, I think that maturity is kind of is kind of like the you know we talk about the inner child and everything and I think maturity is like the rings on a tree you know you still have the the sapling is still there it's just the rings build outward and outward that kind of thing so as I was scared and confused and terrified I um I, you know there was a, there was a, a a version of me inside that was a scared, terrified little boy that wanted to cry and, you know, wanted to cry for an adult. There was a teenager inside me that wanted to have a panic attack and punch the wall. Um, there was a, um, you know, a, a young man in me that wanted to go find anybody else to, to handle the situation. And what was amazing to me as I sat and thought about it was the thing that gave, that comforted all of that was that instantly when that 
crisis situation presented itself, I instantly took command of the situation. I instantly took command, and all of that stuff was inside me. All of that fear and all of that chaos and uncertainty um, and all of the the, uh, confusion and all of that was still inside me. But as I sat there eating, I thought, I realized what made me feel what what made me able to function what made me feel confident despite all of that what made me feel competent despite all of that what made me feel able to um be the the functional adult that was needed in that situation ironically was the fact that I was in charge, that I was in command, that I was in control of the situation. That was what gave me comfort. I didn't, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, you know, other people checked on me to see how I was doing and everything and gave me, you know, gave me support and everything. But, so I, I certainly needed that and appreciated it. But the thing that kept me from, you know, just collapsing into a blubbering, scared mess was this automatic feeling, I'm in command. I've got this. I'm going to handle this. And it's such an odd feeling of like, you know, this interior collection of chaos and fear and panic and all of these things. This, this, uh, This part of me that was still processing the trauma of seeing the emergency situation present itself... And it was a scary thing to see. All of that was comforted by the fact that I knew I was in command. That I knew I was in charge of this situation. And that's the the oddest thing, because you would think that being put in the captain seat, being put in the pilot seat of the aircraft, so to speak, would suddenly be terrifying. It would be terrifying. It would be the least comforting thing in the world. But instead... It was the it gave me the comfort that I needed, and I understand something when I say this. Obviously, there are there are women out there who could handle this situation just like I did and take charge just like I did and all of that. I'm not negating that, but as far as you know, but I but I realized that this is what being a man. What they talk, what they're talking about when they say "be a man," when they say, uh, you know, when they talk about healthy masculinity, they talk about true masculinity. That's what this is. And I was pleased that I was able to rise to that occasion. And it, and I thought about it, and the, this came to my my mind because I was thinking about Andrew Tate uh, in general. And when I finally got to a point where I could, you know, stop and, you know, relax for a minute and had some some thought time to myself and everything, uh, I um, I thought about Andrew Tate and I thought, you know, I thought about the the thing that's gone around. Maybe you've seen it where he talks about how a man should carry a sword with him at all times in his house, uh, so that if his wife gets out of line, he can brandish the sword in her face to scare her back into place. And I thought, that is not a manifestation of masculinity at all. That is the behavior of a small-dicked loser that's very scared and is uh overcompensating in the extreme for an extreme lack of a sense of self and a sense of personal command in a situation it's not masculine behavior it's pathetic and being such a successful internet grifter that you can afford to bankroll an endless supply of prostitutes is not masculine, it's not manly, it's not impressive, and it's not, um, it's, it's not aspirational. 
you know, being, being, uh, you know, being a, a wealthy fake or a rich fake is still being a fake. And I thought about it and I thought about how long I struggled inwardly with those negative messages. You know, my negative experience, uh, with all of these ideas began long before, uh, the manosphere was a thing going all the way back to, you know, seeing the, you know, when I was in college watching the pickup artist phenomenon taking off and feeling like I would never have the ability to rise to, you know, the never have the ability to be one of these guys like Neil Strauss and mystery and all this shit, uh, that I was just doomed to be alone forever because of that. Even before that, when I was a teenager, and I've talked about ex the extraordinary trauma that I encountered from, there was a, a gang of bullies at my school that would beat up girls for talking to me. And, uh, you know, did that's one example, did a lot of other things that they should have been in prison for, should have been put in jail for. And feeling like watching those guys be the ones who are successful with girls and thinking I'd never live up to that and everything. And I thought about all, I was sitting there thinking about all of this ridiculous stuff that I had watched and for so long felt like I'll never be good enough to live up to that. And I thought about something. I had this revelation there as I was sitting there eating uh, lunch and everything or dinner or whatever. I thought... This person, while I am in this mindset, this mindset of this person who has taken control of this situation, gotten the help that was needed, and um, resolved this potentially um, resolved this potentially very, very serious uh, situation. Would. Would being a person like Andrew Tate or Mystery or Neil Strauss during his pickup artist days or Rouge V during his pickup artist days, would being any kind of person like that give me the inner fortitude that I need to be this person that I was today? And the answer is no. In fact, mentioning Rouge V is very apropos here because. Uh, one of the big things, according to him, and I obviously I take everything Rouge V says with a grain, a, a, not just a grain of salt, with a large bag, a dump truck full of salt. But, um, you know, I um, one of the things I read him saying was that one of the things that brought him around to want to make this dramatic lifestyle shift um, from the outer extremes of being a, being basically Glenn Quagmire into being, uh, this chaste, deeply devout religious man and everything was that, you know, he was living that lifestyle had put him in a place, not just geographically, but emotionally and spiritually where he was not able to take care of the people in his life, his parents, his sister, that sort of thing that he needed, uh, that needed him. And, you know, that that was a contributing factor in the realization of how pathetic and ridiculous his life had become. And I thought about women in general as like, you know, this thing that, uh, the, uh, and I say, when I say thing, I mean, women as a concept related to men, not into, I'm not calling individual women things, but womanhood and femininity and women as a concept as it relates to uh, men and masculinity and all of that. And I thought, does the person that I became in this situation, is that person impressed by a bimbo floozy that would uh, that would consider being Andrew Tate's arm candy something to aspire to. Am I impressed by that? No. And 
if she if if I were if I were vying for the affections of a woman and the person I was today did not communicate to her that I have something to offer and contribute as a partner that I am a viable option and even more so if she chose some ridiculous cartoon character cretin like Andrew Tate would I have lost anything? No. Would that be proof that I am not, that I'm a, a beta male or a, a mega male or a gamma male who's not, who, who doesn't deserve to have access to the females and all of this stuff? No. All it would prove is that that woman has uh, either a very skewed and very shallow and very, uh, frankly, despicable set of values, or she has no values whatsoever. And that gave me a lot of perspective today. And so that's why I'm, I'm saying this now. Because I want to, not even, I mean, I want to get it out there and make, put the message out there and put the conversation piece out there for people and everything. But... I I want to also just preserve this mindset. What I'm saying here as a, a time capsule, essentially, to myself and something that I can look back on when, um, when I'm doubting myself again in the future. I had a real, you know, I really fell hard years ago, crashed and burned in a very real way, and I entered a mindset where I no longer trusted myself to make um, sound decisions, to be a quality person, to be a valid human being or anything like that, and I realized that I'm, I feel like today... I had a very real basis for something to start rebuilding what my internal values really are. Rebuilding that. And building it off of this. This, this aspect of me. And knowing that this part of me is there if I need it. That's what matters. Not one thing that Andrew Tate has ever taught anybody matters. And so that... And by the way, as I conclude this message for today, if you are some Andrew Tate supporter that wants to sit and, you know, has convinced yourself that Andrew Tate is some person of serious value or worth that I and that I'm just so totally wrong about him and everything he is um I don't care to hear from you I don't want to get, hear your comments um I say that because obviously there will always be people who write in with snarky and asinine you know deliberately assholeish comments but I um I don't uh, what I don't want to hear are the people hear from at all are the people who sincerely think that uh, they can offer some, you know, thoughtful, um, you know, so some thoughtful observation or perspective on Andrew Tate that will make me see some, that he's some serious, legitimate person or something like that. I don't care to hear from you in that regard, and if you try to give me that shit, I'm going to block you. So, anyway, those are my thoughts on this matter, and... It seems like we live in a world where we live in a world where you know half the people think that toxic masculinity is the only kind of masculinity that exists. The other half of people think that um well basically no put it this way. We live in a world where a hundred percent of the people think that toxic masculinity is the only kind of masculinity that there is, and the dialogue is not about what is a healthy form of masculinity. The dialogue is uh, whether or not to embrace toxic masculinity. 
Um, and nobody, you know, nobody seems to any, or the, the rare soul that wants to come forward and say that there's a positive version of masculinity out there gets automatically lumped in with the Andrew Tate people because nobody can comprehend that positive concept. I saw a thing, uh, a brief clip from um, David Pakman uh, recently, who's not somebody I watch, but somebody reposted on Twitter, where he started talking about, you know, how do we keep men from, uh, how, how do we keep men from uh, discovering toxic, uh, the toxic masculinity espoused by people like Andrew Tate and Jordan Peterson? Jordan Peterson's worldview is about as far removed from Andrew Tate. Whether you agree with him or not, his worldview is about as far removed from Andrew Tate as you could ever possibly be. I mean, my God, Jordan Peterson says, uh, you know, you, you've got one person who says, uh, don't watch pornography. It's you know. Don't watch pornography. It's uh, um, instead focus on finding one woman that's right for you that you can start a family with and take on adult responsibilities, and that's Jordan Peterson. And then you have the Andrew Tate thing where he's telling you to invest in cryptocurrency and start pimping out women and uh, and and living this again, this ridiculous lifestyle where you seem like a character from Grand Theft Auto V, and this just this life of just decadent irresponsibility that would be completely unimpressive to Jordan Peterson. It's like, it's impossible for people to comprehend the difference between those people. But there is a real healthy masculine archetype out there to be embodied. And Despite everything that I went through today and that the person I was taking care of went through today, I am grateful that I had the opportunity to embody that archetype.